Well, it's uh, been a beautiful presentation, musicians and singers. Uh, it was really moving, and it's my joy on this Christmas night to, or Christmas Eve, to share from a passage of scripture that everyone, when they when they read it, they get bowled over because it's probably the greatest prophetic statement that was written in the Old Testament about Jesus. And I'll never get sick of uh, reading it. Uh, I want to read it to you in the message. And let's look at Isaiah's prophecy about Jesus. And we see the God of hope in this passage. For a child has been born for us. How's that? The gift of a son for us, for you and for me. His names will be amazing counsellor. Strong God, Almighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace or Prince of Wholeness. I love that. His, his ruling authority will grow and there, there'll be no limits to the wholeness he brings. Wow, isn't that a great statement? 700 years before the birth of Jesus Christ, this statement was made. And our world today, like it's always been, but particularly today, is starving for real and lasting hope. And you may be here tonight, and uh, your hope quota is pretty low. And I pray that through what's happening in this service, that you'll be encouraged, that you'll be given tremendous hope as you fix your eyes upon Jesus Christ, whom we celebrate this Christmas season. The Christmas story gives us the answer as to the source of this hope. It's a person and he is very much alive and he's so ready to minister to you and to me today. For a child has been born for us, the gift of a son for us. The names that Isaiah says, he's an amazing counsellor. I see this as Jesus being the loving wisdom of God. When he said he is going to be the amazing counsellor, when you read the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, you see Jesus speaking and acting and ministering to people and helping people with just pure wisdom. He is the greatest counsellor. He is the best carer. He is the best lover of people. As you read the Gospels, you get bowled over. You feel like he is loving on you. You feel like he is caring for you. And, and your eyes are opened and you see, man, this is more than a man. This is the God man. Only God can touch my heart through the words of Jesus that have been recorded for our benefit. And so look at this statement in John 1.14. I love this. So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love or grace and faithfulness or truth. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. Isaiah predicted and prophesied that he would be the amazing counsellor, God's loving wisdom, the extravagance of Jesus' love and of his grace and of his truth and of his faithfulness is, is such good news. I have experienced his presence and, and his reality for nearly 50 years. And uh, I can tell you, he is real. The baby that was born, the eternal son that became Jesus of Nazareth, a baby that was born that we celebrate, he grew up and he lived among us. And what he said and what he did is recorded in four magnificent gospels. Gospel means good news. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I would encourage you, read them. In this Christmas uh, season, if, if you haven't given your life to Christ and you want to know more about who he is, read what he said, read what he did, how he acted, how he reacted, and, uh, and you will experience his presence and his amazing grace as you open your heart. I don't believe any human being can read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John the inspired words of Jesus with an open heart, an open mind, and say, God, if you're real, speak to me. Just a simple prayer like that. Just say, well, God, if you're real, speak to me. 
And if a person does that, God does amazing things. Happened to me as a 17 year old. I'm a little bit older now. And I'll be celebrating my, my 50 years as a Christian next year. Or the year after next, sorry, yeah. And, uh, and I started doing that. I had a little Red Gideon's Bible that was given to me in, in year seven or year eight in high school. And they, they came around and gave me this little red Bible and it just gathered dust <laughs> until I was 17. I found it. And I opened it up and I... In my mind, I thought, oh, the Bible, the Gospels, that, that's just mythology, like Greek myths, you know, Hercules and Jason and, and all, all that stuff, because I was brought up with understanding Greek mythology, the pantheon of the gods, and I thought, oh, maybe it's all, all there. But when I read it, I couldn't believe. I thought, man, how come someone didn't tell me this? What a fantastic book. What a story. Nobody could make this up. It has to be God himself. And something happens. Our hearts get warmed. Our minds get informed. Something stirs within. God starts to manifest his presence when people start to read the words of Jesus, the amazing, wise words of Jesus. Secondly, he's a strong God. Jesus is the limitless power of God. This is what Isaiah said. Not only is he the, 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 the loving wisdom of God, but he, he is the limitless power power of God. Have a look at this statement of Jesus in Matthew 19. He says, Jesus looked at them intently and said, humanly speaking, it's impossible. There are lots of things, humanly speaking, that are impossible. But with God, everything is possible. God so loves to display his creativity and his power to show us that nothing is impossible with him. He answers prayer. He intervenes in our lives. In fact, I would argue that anything that's good in our world, every good and perfect gift comes from the Father, comes from God, comes from Jesus. And, and I look at, uh, I know when I was um, 12 years of age, I, I had double pneumonia in my lungs, really sick. I was in hospital for, for two weeks. And I still remember it because they used to get this great big needle. And in those days, they're about this big. And the nurse would come, say, okay, roll over. Which side do you want it on? Penicillin. And I had felt my backside. I said, oh, try this side here. And it hurt so much. I used to hide in the toilets at six o'clock in the morning so she wouldn't get me. They knew. But you know, 50 years earlier, in fact, before the, the, the Second World War, you'd get double pneumonia. A lot of people would just die. In fact, I was so sick. They rushed me to hospital. My lungs were filled. I was really sick as a dog. I probably would have died. Who invented penicillin? I think God gave Alexander Fleming an idea. And he sees mold on, on, on a piece of bread and, and he sees it some bacteria accidentally. And then a guy named Howard Florey from Adelaide, he takes what he discovered and produced penicillin, which has saved hundreds of millions of lives. God is the author of everything that is good. How many have had a bad infection and you've been on antibiotics or, or penicillin? Anyone? A bad infection? Yeah. You probably would have died if you didn't have it. You know, people would die of toothaches. You'd get an abscess in your tooth, no penicillin, you're gone. A stack of people would, 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 would pass away before. So I see this as a display in the natural of God's power. He actually loves people and he wants to do as much good to alleviate pain and suffering and evil and sickness that, that he, his power is displayed by the creativity of what can come into our minds and hearts. And people actually say this. They say, where did this invention come from? I don't know. Something popped into my brain. Um, anyone been, in, been thrown in an MRI machine? I have a couple of times. Oh, I tell you, you don't want to be thrown in one. They make an awful noise. And it's about this far from you. They, they measured my brain once. They wanted to do a test on me. And the, the, the specialist said, oh, he was an Indian chap. And he, he goes, you have a pristine brain. Because <laughs> they didn't know what was wrong with me. It was quite a few years ago. But I tell you, it's a heck of a machine. It goes like this. If you've got claustrophobia, and it makes a racket. So the next time I said, she said, I said, can you lift it up a bit? No, I can't do that. I said, put some blindfolds on me. And the noise is so bad. 
And I said, what kind of music do you want? I said, give me hard rock, will you? Something that I can get the noise. <laughs> that machine has transformed internal medicine. They can actually see everything inside of you. And the guy who invented it was a young guy in his early 20s. He got saved. He became a Christian at a Billy Graham crusade in 1957 in New York. He's a scientist. He's a medical student. He's, he's actually became a medical doctor, specialist, plus science degrees. And, and he has this idea. And they said, you're crazy, Raymond. Raymond Demation's his name. You're crazy. He says, well, we x-ray the body and we can see the bones. What if we can x-ray the heart, the colon, the liver and see what's going on? So how do you do it? And he discovered, because we'll magnetise the cells. We'll get them to stick up, ding, and photograph them. I said, you can't do that to heart tissue and liver tissue and, and you'll kill people. And he goes, so you had the idea. And when you hear him testify, he's, in, he's 83 now, he says, God gave him the idea. And so he builds this machine. They've, it's in the Smithsonian, you can see it. And he was so brave and courageous, he threw his assistant in there. <laughs> and it worked, it worked. And his vision was that every hospital throughout the world would have at least one machine. God's power is displayed by the wonderful inventions, the wonderful um, discoveries and breakthroughs that take place. Because God loves people. God's not divorced from helping human beings. And... This scripture says, Jesus looked at them intensely and said, humanly speaking, it's impossible. There are lots of impossibilities in our natural world. But he said, but with God, everything is possible. You may be facing something this, this Christmas season that in the natural seems impossible. It just seems absolutely difficult. It, it's like, how can this relationship problem ever be, be fixed? It's like, it just seems impossible. Nothing's impossible with God. Or you might be facing an illness or some difficulty and, and they're doing the best they can, but it just seems like an impossible situation. Don't lose hope. Don't lose courage. God is the God of the impossible. He loves to do good. He loves to display his power. And, and uh, this scripture here with Isaiah, he says, he's the mighty God. He's a strong God. Jesus is the limitless power of God. Thirdly, Isaiah says he's the eternal father. Jesus is the liberating image of God. Look at the scripture in Hebrews 1.3. I'm just taking a, a New Testament passage for every point I'm making. The sun radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. This is the mystery. People have wanted to know what is God like? So human philosophy, trying to find the meaning of life. The ancient Greeks started it. You know, you read Socrates and, and uh, Plato and Aristotle, they're trying to know what's the meaning of life. And then you have all the religious leaders who are, who are trying to say, well, if God's out there, we think there's a God who's behind everything, and they're trying to figure out what he's like. And so human beings are incurably religious. We are wired for God. He made us, we ran away from him, but the desire for ultimate meaning and purpose in our lives remains. And so we search for it and we'll fill that hole with something. And so people are searching for God and the myriad of religions that are around the place. And I'm not here to criticize those religions. In fact, I did a, a major, sub-major at university for four years on other religions. And I really enjoyed studying Hinduism and Buddhism and Islam and you know, uh, Zoroastrianism and Taoism and Confucian, all that stuff. It was fantastic. Read lots of books on it. And one of the key books I read was called The Religions of Man. And it dawned upon me, that's exactly right. They're the religions of man. Human beings trying to reach out to God to say, what are you like? The good news with this passage is, is that God said, I'm going to do away with all your crazy notions. Because some of the ideas may be good, but some of the ideas are not quite good. You read about the ancient Greeks and the pantheon of their gods. Their gods are reflective of their own imagination. So they had gods for this and gods for that and gods for that, and they were terrible beings. And so here in, in Jesus Christ, he says, the sun radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. And so if you want to know what God is really like, you look at Jesus. You look into his eyes. 
You listen to his, you read his words and you reflect on how he acted, reacted and responded. And, and God said, I'm not just stuck in heaven. I've come to visit the planet. I'm walking with you. I'm eating with you. I'm talking to you and with you. I'm having fellowship with you. I'm connecting with you. I'm one of you now. The eternal son will always look like a human being. The eternal son was a spirit being, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the price that God had paid was that the son would always be looking like a 33-year-old man, a Palestinian Jew. And the marks of his death on a cross are still on his body. For when he was resurrected, he said to Thomas, hey, you don't believe? Feel. Stick your hand here. There's a great big wound. You can almost put your hand up there and grab my heart. So Jesus, as he came to this earth, God is saying, now this is exactly what I'm like. I'm totally good. I'm totally merciful. I'm totally kind. I'm totally just. If you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. God the Father is exactly like Jesus. God the Holy Spirit, who is, a, who is with us now, when Jesus went back to heaven, is just like Jesus. And so any confusing thoughts or, or ambiguities or or strange notions that you might have will be done away with when you focus on Jesus. As Isaiah says, he is the everlasting, the eternal father. And finally, he's the prince of peace or the prince of wholeness. Jesus is the lasting salvation of God. In Romans, Paul says, therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight, by faith, by trusting, not by trying, not by doing, but by, by faith, by trusting in what Jesus has done for us through his life and his death on a cross. He came to earth in the Christmas season that we celebrate, but the major purpose of him coming was to die on a cross to deal with the separation between perfection and imperfection. God who is pure and sinless and we who are impure and very sinful. And we could not cover our sins. We could not forgive ourselves. We can't, can't cleanse our consciences. We can't change the orientation of our hearts. Only God can do that. So he says here, hey, therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. And Isaiah says there will be no limits to the wholeness he brings. And so the world searches for peace and peace can never come until we have peace with God. And that can only occur when we put our trust in him. And then when we, when we know that our sins have been forgiven, our consciences have been cleansed, our, our hearts have been purified. And when that occurs and you have a relationship with him through Jesus, amazing peace and tranquility overtake your own heart your own spirit and so peace spreads and you become a peaceful person so peace spiritually peace with God peace the peace of God within us psychologically emotionally people that have given their lives to Christ and who, who understand who he is and what he's done for them psychologically emotionally get better that, that healing flows more easily with people who have put their faith in Christ. And then peace between people, relationally. So his peace spreads, as Isaiah says. Jesus is the lasting salvation of God. He is the prince of wholeness. Some of you need his peace to be spreading in your life, to be growing in your life. There's turmoil in your family. There might be turmoil in your own emotions. When you turn your heart over to him, and you say, Jesus, come into my life. Bring me into a right relationship with God the Father so that, I, so that all my guilt can be removed and fear and shame. Help me to know that everything is it's a brand new life now, that I'm saved for eternity, come what may, that you give the gift of eternal life. Amazingly, when, when you're spiritually renewed and restored and you have peace with God, how amazing peace comes in to your life emotionally, psychologically, and it gives you the power to be able to live peacefully with other people.
Jesus is the loving wisdom of God. Jesus is the limitless power of God. Jesus is the liberating image of God. Jesus is the lasting salvation of God. Isaiah says, for unto us a child is born. He personalizes it to us. To us a son is given. And tonight, before we conclude, we want to take communion together, the Lord's Supper. This is something that Jesus instituted before he died. And he said, do this as often as you can to remember me, because it helps us to understand who he is, but more importantly, to appropriate or to be able to receive him into our lives. And so tonight, I don't know where you're at, but for most of us here, we know Jesus, we love him, we serve him. But if you're a guest here uh, tonight, our prayer is that you would come to know him the loving wisdom of God. You would come to experience his limitless power and understand that he reveals who God is and that salvation will come to your house, to your life, that his peace will permeate your life and grow in your life. And communion is, is a, a ceremony where we say, well, look, it's about the cross. We celebrate the baby being born at Christmas, but you can't really understand it unless you focus also on Easter that he died to bring you peace, to reconcile you to, to God the Father. So we're going to take this uh, uh, communion together. And this is open to everyone. This is not just the Christian Family Center's table. Uh, people say, oh, maybe you've got to be a full-on believer in Christ to take it. Oh, I, think, I don't think so. I think if you're inquiring, if you're interested, if you're saying, God, I don't know, maybe you want to pray that prayer and say, God, if you're really there, I'm going to eat and drink this thing. And I say, if you're really there, reveal yourself to me. Because as you eat and drink, it's an act of faith. They're saying, Jesus, you died on a cross for me. You rose for me. Help me to understand it more. So let me lead you in a prayer before the emblems are brought to us. Father, we thank you for this wonderful night that we're able to open up your book, the Bible, that we can quote from Isaiah and from the Gospels and centre our thoughts on the reason for Christmas, that it's about Jesus. He is our hope, our living hope. The world was surprised and given hope and the world is still being surprised and we are being surprised by the amazing hope that you bring, the security, the safety, the salvation, the gift of eternal life, forgiveness, transformation, a new beginning, and I pray for everyone here as we take communion together, that by your Holy Spirit, you will touch people's lives and some miracles will occur. And that your peace will grow. As Isaiah says, his ruling authority will grow and there'll be no limits to the wholeness he brings. So Lord, may this be outworked as we take these emblems together, as we celebrate who Jesus is this Christmas season. We ask these things in his name.